So today we're going to be looking at something called random Boolean networks. And random Boolean networks were created to try and understand the complexities of biological systems. So biological systems, cells do lots of very complicated things. Um, and at the, the random Boolean network was a, demonstra a demonstration to try and understand whether these complicated behaviours could arise from actually very simple rules. Um, so the random Boolean network is a computational model built up of very simple rules to see that if out, can out of these simple rules very complex behaviour emerge. This reminds me a little bit of Conway's Game of Life, which we've we've briefly discussed on the channel. Is it something similar to that, or is it is this the same? Yeah, no. So it's um, it's a little bit different, but it isn't. It is very similar. So a random Boolean network uh, consists of a set of nodes, and the way these nodes change over time, they have specific rules, which are a little bit like Conway's Game of Life. Um, so yeah, not not too dissimilar. How does it work then? Where where do you start with one of these? A random Boolean network can be described as um, a set of twenty nodes each of which has a Boolean state attached to it. And for any given node, its Boolean state is determined by connections to other nodes within the network. So each node's behavior is determined by the other nodes in the network, like a, a complex interacting system. So bef before we get the comments about drinking game, drink every time he says Boolean, when we're saying that, we're talking about a true or a false or a one or a zero, are we? Exactly that, yeah. So Boolean values are um, either on or off or ones and zeros. We're going to be using ones and zeros in this work. What you can think of is that you can have 20 nodes to start with. All of them exist within one column to start with. And each of these nodes within the network has connections to other nodes. This is how you initialize a network. And we're just going to say that each node within the network is connected to three other nodes. You then get the values of the nodes in which it's connected to. And because we've only got three connections, we're going to get um, three Boolean values out of that. So something like 001, 111, 101, something like that. And then what we do is we build a truth table. We've got eight different options, so essentially counting from zero to seven in binary. That's in one column of the truth table. In the other column, we then randomly assign a result to this. And we only do this once at the start of the program, so that if a given node has connections which um, give it the values 101, that node will then change its state to zero. If it has connections that give it 001, then that node will change its value to one. And we do this all at the same time. And then once this is completed, we then get a new set of 20 Boolean states for our nodes. And then we can repeat this over successive iterations and get this behavior as time moves on over successive time steps. So we'll get these 20 nodes, each of which has a state one or zero. And then each one is being fed by three or, you know, up to three of the other nodes. And then you get the next step and then exactly you iterate that. and iterate. Yep, that's how it's done. Um, so yes, not 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 terribly complicated. Simple rules. Um, Boolean values everywhere. Um, they randomly start. Uh, they randomly start with randomly assigned um, Boolean variables. The truth tables got random Boolean variables in it. So you would expect it just to be uh, a bit of a mess, but it does show some some very interesting behaviour. I programmed this. Um, to show you, so I can actually show you the, the output from um, from the program, and I've got a few um, a few different examples of this. So, when you first start with a random Boolean network and everything's um, random, as the name suggests, you'd expect it, the output just to be a bit of a mess, and sometimes that's exactly what it is. So, if I just load up an example here, so just to explain this, in the way that I've coded it, a zero is represented as a zero, so that's false, and a one is represented as a space. And that just makes it easier to see the patterns within the network. And this is pretty much what you'd expect from such a system. At the start, because it's a bit random, you'd get some random behavior, which you see here, and then everything would just peter towards some steady, boring state, which is what we've got here, which is um, some nodes in the network being permanently off, but some of them switching between ons and offs as time goes by. So this is exactly what you'd expect. And there are a few examples of this. And this is a, an example of a network where everything just turns on forever. So this is actually what I would expect to happen from a network which was built in this way. However, we can also get these cycles that appear. And again, the, the networks start off 
and they've got some, some random noise here, they're not doing too much, but they fall into this cyclical repeating pattern, which is quite interesting. For something that's so, so random, I wouldn't have expected this, um, this type of behavior to happen, but it actually happens relatively frequently. Um, and there are different examples of this that we can see. So all of which start off, as I say, in a bit of a random state, but then tend towards some nice, nice regular patterns. This is a nice property of the network, but I don't think it's particularly amazing as of yet, but there are some, some other properties that the networks have um, as well. So one of the things that we've seen seen here is that these patterns, are they're quite obviously repeating, but the networks also demonstrate, so even with this pattern, this is quite a complicated one, but if you look at the spaces here, these squares here in this shape, you can see this pattern repeating. So even though this is quite complex, this is still a repeating, a repeating pattern. But we can also get behaviors that, because um, all behaviors in a random Boolean network ultimately will repeat in the end. We can also get ones which have longer cycles and they're so long that we actually can't see the behavior. We can't see the repeating pattern here. There will be a repeating pattern, but it's too long to fit on the screen. And there are a few examples of this, just where we get something which we can't quite understand. That one looks like it's got a bit of a repeating pattern there, but no, we can't see the repeating cycle. So. So that's all. That's all. I, I suppose mildly interesting in that you have you have different behaviours that you can get from differently randomly initialised states of the network. Okay. But one of the most interesting properties of this is when we were looking at the biological systems, which I, I suppose this um, network was supposed to naively um, emulate. Um, Biological systems are very robust. So cells and things like that, they can actually deal with quite a lot before they um, before they start. Um, start having problems. And one of the ideas that you can look at with these networks is can we inject uh, perturbation into this network and, and see how um, it responds over, over time? We can do exactly that. What's perturbation then? Is that just a change? Is that a fancy word for changing it? So that's exactly what it is. So what we're actually going to do is about halfway through um, the network operating, we are gonna go through five nodes of the network and just change their bits. So we're just gonna, if it's a one, we're gonna flip it to a zero, and if it's a zero, we're gonna flip it to a one. And we're just gonna see what happens after that. Again, one of the things that you would expect to see here is that the networks just change what they're doing and continue in this new state for, for the rest of time. And sometimes that's exactly what happened. This perturbation injected here, and you can see that the repeating pattern changes. So we have a bit of a mess down here, and then the network just changes into a, a different but other cyclical state. And there are a few examples of this, again, of, ju of just one state transforming into another because of this perturbation, but still maintaining its regularity, but just a different kind of regularity. It sort of reminds me of uh, gene mutations. Yep, so it was exactly that. So the idea that if you have a simple organism and can mutate genes, if other genes are, reply are, are relying on the products of those genes, then you can have, um, changes within the biological system. Does something else need to come in to take over um, what was caused by that perturbation? Um, and th th that was exactly the point of these networks is to try and show that, um, you know, robustness specifically, although we're not demonstrating robustness right now, robustness can come out of very, very simple, um, simple networks with very simple rules. So there is a chance that biology itself might be underpinned by such rules, which are indeed as simple. We just don't know what they are yet. Um, so yeah, these are so when we inject the perturbations here, we can see that the networks change over time, but go into a different type of regular behaviour. However, there's a few networks where we inject the perturbation here, and then the network recovers from that perturbation to be exactly where it was. And I think this is the behaviour that people are most interested in because I think this most captures um, sort of the, the 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 principle of robustness in biology that things have to accept perturbations and go back to what they're doing. And we have to point out here that there is a chance, because this network doesn't really change too much. There's a little bit of a change we can see, because we've got these four repeating zeros and it changes to three there, but then goes back to four. But it's, it, it could be possible that in this network, there's just not too many connections to the, these five nodes. So if we change them, it might not have that much of an effect on the network. So that's possible. So let's look at a, a few more examples. This is another example where we have um, a change to the repeating pattern that you can probably see by looking at the top. We've got this bit of confusion here, which isn't seen before, but then it goes back into the repeating pattern that it had before. So we, we 
gave it this perturbation, it doesn't seem to be too affected by it. So the, the, basically the no, all the nodes are is they just hold a Boolean state. So all I'm doing is I'm going in and I'm just flicking that Boolean state over, um, which will affect, so um, for all genes that are connected to, oh, sorry, all nodes that are connected to either one of these five nodes, um, that will affect how they interact with the truth table that, that we showed. So they might get a different result there. But even, even with that change, we can see that they go back to the same repeating behavior they had before. So I think one of the most interesting examples I can show that I found just from randomly searching these networks is after we um, put the perturbation in this network, a lot of the network changes. So there's a lot of changes down here. There's a lot of changes here and here as well. But only after about 10 time steps of what is a relatively significant perturbation for a network that's only got 20 nodes, we're, we're, we're switching five of them, it goes back into this regular state, which is something that's quite unexpected for such a such a simply constructed network to have this behavior. And as I said, I think this, this is sort of a, a visual description of the behavior that I think Stuart Calvin was looking for when he created these models, is to try and show, well, actually, no, lots of interacting units which have very simple behavior can out of which can emerge very complex behavior which um, can underpin lots of the natural phenomena that we see in the in the natural world so i think yeah i think this is a nice description of exactly what um Stuart Calvin was trying to show with these and this idea that you can perturb the networks and they can ultimately recover to to doing do what they were doing before you only have to work out whether it's worth alerting the user if you find the key. So, you know, you download the temporary exposure key, you perform the, the encryption, you generate the potential RPIs and you compare them with the ones you see. Fill the Bergen with the most value without going over a specified weight limit.